Careers are complex. There's emergence, pivots, and unexpected turns. Many moments in a successful career are at least half luck, though it is possible to be more or less prepared for luck and randomness in your career. This episode is an excerpt from one of our monthly Humanizing Work conference alumni community sessions that meet every first Friday. In this excerpt, Peter shares about a 20-minute presentation talking about his circuitous career path and five lessons he's learned along the way that might be useful to you. If you're part of that conference alumni community and you missed the original session, by the way, uh, you're definitely going to want to check out the full session recording on the community site because there was a great discussion after the presentation where participants shared their own career lessons and resources. Also note that because Peter is speaking to a group of longtime clients and friends, there are a few points where he says something like, you've probably already heard me tell this story, and then glosses over the details. I don't think that'll get in the way of the overall narrative and lessons, but if there is something you'd like to hear more about, send us an email at mailbag at humanizingwork.com, or if you're watching the YouTube video version of this, drop a comment below the video. Uh, so without further ado, here's Peter. Uh, getting into it, I had to get clear for myself on how I think about what career development means. Uh, and so I'll share kind of five lessons I've learned in that winding career, but I wanted to start with how I ended up framing what I meant by career development. And so I thought of it as having kind of three tiers or three, I guess, pillars is probably a better way to say it, um, where when we're developing our career, we're trying to increase our capability. Uh, and that allows us to more effectively contribute in our current role. And then as we develop our capability, that tends to also open up doors for future roles. Then the other one, I think, is equally as critical. And as I've developed in my career, what I've really been seeking for a lot of times is um, greater meaning in the work that I do. So for most of us, we start working because we need a paycheck, we need the financial stability that a job brings. And that doesn't ever fully go away, but we spend so much of our waking hours at work. And as we devote more and more time and energy to a pursuit, I think we'll burn out or start to get cynical if we're, our, if we're not also developing our ability to find more and more meaning in the work that we do. Uh, so that can be developing stronger connections with our coworkers. It could be creating the space for teams to gel and get into flow by studying awesome books on said topic like this one. Um, <laughs> and uh, it could be just developing better products and services for our customers, uh, which brings us kind of to the third component here, uh, which is having increasing impact. So as we progress you know, develop our capability, develop more meaning. Um, then we develop the ability to have a larger and larger positive impact on everyone around us. And in effective organizations, I think this usually means we're advancing to positions of more authority and influence. But even without a change in job title, uh, we can become more capable of creating outcomes that matter, which is our favorite definition of leadership that comes from the leadership circle folks. Um, leadership means creating outcomes that matter to us. All right, so that's how I thought about it as we're developing our career, more capability, more meaning, more impact. And then that tends to, like, as I mentioned, results in moving up the career ladder. So I've got, like I mentioned, this kind of long and winding road of career development. And as many of you know, I started my career as a professional musician. That's kind of what I looked like uh, in my 20s. Um, that must have been a fancy gig because I had a tuxedo on. Um, and then you know, we, I got married and we started having kids and I was ambitious and I wanted to be successful and I wanted to move up the, the career ladder of a musician, which means better and better gigs, better paying, more exposure, playing with better musicians. I wanted to help support myself and my family more effectively. Uh, and so part of that was like the natural desire to be a better provider for the family. But there wasn't a small part of it that was also kind of like ego. Like there was some ego involved in my ambition because the way you work up in the music world is you develop a network with players that are already on the gigs you want to be on. And that usually involves getting like a rare opportunity to sub on one of those better gigs when someone else can't make it kind of last minute, 
showing up, playing well, impressing the rest of the band, and you get the call. So I was focused a lot on that in my early music career. But what I discovered is the more I focused on impressing other players, the harder I found it to perform well. Like when I would have a chance to play with someone I admired, someone that might help me land bigger and better gigs, I found myself kind of getting nervous. Like, oh, so-and-so's on the gig. I better play well. Uh, Got to kind of prove how good I am. And worst of all, in that situation, I often found that I wasn't really present and enjoying the music itself. And it was around that time that I came across a fantastic book that I know at least a few of you have come across as well, called The Art of Possibility uh, by Roz and Ben Zander. And in chapter four of that book, they described what became the antidote to my dilemma here. They called it being a contribution. Instead of being uh, like focused on being successful and impressing people, the Xanders just invite in that chapter to be a contribution to whatever you can, whenever you can. Now, on the very next gig I had after reading this chapter, one of my trumpet heroes showed up to play in the section that night. He was subbing for one of our usual trumpet players that was out sick. And I felt the nerves start to creep up and the desire to impress that player. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm supposed to just be a contribution. What does that mean here? Like be a contribution to the music, be a good bandmate, make a difference for the audience. And that simple thought kind of changed everything for me on that gig. Like my nerves subsided a little bit. Uh, I've refocused from proving myself to just immersing myself in the sound and the feel of the music and how the audience was responding and how cool it is to be able to do this for a living. And not surprisingly, I played pretty well that night because of that focus. And that trumpet player ended up being coming a close friend and bigger and bigger, better gigs did follow, but not because I was trying to land bigger and better gigs. I was simply trying to be a contribution to the gig I was on. So lesson one for me in my career is to be a contribution, to focus less on moving up and to focus on contributing however you can on that day. And the more I've done this, the more opportunities have opened up in my life. So it's kind of a, one of those judo moves where if you focus on the thing you want, it's harder to get. If you focus on the right things, then the thing you want becomes easier. All right, as our family continued to grow, uh, at one point, our health insurance bill finally eclipsed our mortgage bill one month. And I decided I'd better go find a day job that would pay benefits. And I was teaching at a local community college here. And uh, I saw a job posting for a company in Scottsdale, which is just down the road from me. And that company made audio recording and editing software. I really knew nothing about how software was made, but I knew a lot about recording and editing audio in software, having run my own recording studio for a while. And I decided, ah, why not? I'll interview for the job. And I ended up getting hired by that company. And then most of you know this part of the story. A few years later, Adobe acquired that company and we moved to Seattle to work in the office there. Uh, so I, I was hired to be a software tester. Um, and at the time, my plan was to do the day job long enough to put enough money away that I could move back to doing music full time. But the more I did the work, the more I enjoyed it. I discovered that I had a knack for helping the team work more effectively, for improving processes, for coming up with ways to improve our product. And at some point, I realized I didn't actually want to quit anymore. My plan to you know, put some money away and then go back to music no longer seemed like the right plan, uh, which brings us to lesson number two, uh, which is, you know, I think it's good to have a plan, but be on the lookout for new opportunities as soon as you become aware of them. Uh, every five-year plan I've ever come up with has been wrong within two years, and not because plants aren't useful, but because we can't predict what's going to serve us or what opportunities are going to come knocking. So have a plan, but be ready to pivot. All right. Uh, one day as a team meeting wrapped up uh, from this was now the Adobe audition team. We had finished a team meeting and uh, Todd Orler, who had moved from being a software developer on that team to the engineering manager about a year before this meeting, calmly said, I've decided I was much happier being a developer. 
I don't enjoy being a manager. So we need to find a new engineering manager or I'm going to start looking for other positions elsewhere. And Todd was a great developer and we all wanted him to stay on the team. Uh, apparently his five-year plan wasn't working out either and he was ready to pivot. So after the meeting, I was talking to Paul Ellis, who was the program manager on the team at that time. And we were kind of chatting about some of the other, other developers on the team that might be able to move into the manager role. But most of the people we talked about had expressed a similar preference for working on the product over doing management. So we were kind of tossing ideas around of who we might convince to take on the job when a crazy idea popped into my head. I said, you know, Paul, I don't know anything about writing code, but I think I could be a good people manager. Maybe I could be the engineering manager. And Paul, I think a little taken aback by my cutspa, said, eh, maybe, let me think about it a little bit. And the next morning, Paul pulled me aside and he said, hey, I was thinking about what you said last night. And I'm not sure you being the engineering manager would, would be a good idea. You really do need uh, some technical expertise to do that particular job there. I do think you'd be a good manager, but uh, you'd probably need to have the development chops in order for the team to you know, uh, respect you, for you to provide good leadership in that role. Um, so why don't I move into the engineering manager role and I would put you forward to be the program manager. Like we'd both have to interview, we'd both have to you know, actually get accepted in these new positions, but I'd recommend you for it. And so after a few rounds of interviews and with Paul's endorsement, I became the program manager for the audition team. Um, I didn't know anything about how to be a program manager when I put my hand up. I learned how to be a program manager after I got the job. And that's a pattern I've found in my life many times, which is uh, you often have to put your hand up and then learn how to do the thing you're putting your hand up to do. Um, so uh, keep putting your hand up as, as hockey legend Wayne Gretzky used to say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? So I became a program manager because I was willing to volunteer, even though I wasn't really ready to do the job. So that's lesson number three is put your hand up, uh, even if you don't feel like you're ready, uh, that oftentimes we don't need to be ready. We just need to be willing to learn. So that was lesson three for me. And then shortly after becoming a program manager, um, I went to a meeting uh, where they were inviting kind of speakers in to talk to the program managers. And the speaker was Jeff Sutherland, the uh, inventor of Scrum. Many of you have heard this part of the story as well, where Jeff started giving this one hour overview of how Scrum worked and uh, being a new program manager, I was like keenly on the search for ways that we can improve our team. And as he described Scrum, I got really excited about it. I started seeing like uh, potential solutions for problems that we had on our team on our last release. And I thought, ah, oh, we've got to try this thing out. So we did end up trying Scrum out and we got a bunch of benefits from it, as many of you have heard these stories before and uh, other people started noticing it. And so uh, other people got interested in it. Now, at the end of that release, um, I was talking to my then boss and, and he said, hey, I think that um, you know the work that you've done on the audition team has been fantastic. Uh, we'd like to consider you being a group program manager for the creative suite. And maybe you can bring some of this agile stuff to this very large program. So I said, Ooh, okay. Um, that's a very different kind of job, but again, put my hand up. I don't know how to do that job, but I'll do it going back to lesson three. And, uh, what I found was that was a completely different type of work. Uh, it was a lot of coordination. It was a lot of politics. And so sort of to keep myself sane in that job. Um, I kept working with the teams that were now actively adopting Scrum. So the uh, other teams at Adobe had kind of picked up on how it worked for the audition team and were really excited to do it. And so I really did two jobs over the next 18 months. I acted as the group program manager for the creative suite. And then I was working with the Premiere Pro team and the After Effects team and the Encore team, and then eventually the Photoshop team and several of these other teams. I would just volunteer to help out. Uh, to get on a call and answer questions, to coordinate bringing in a trainer to help them learn how to do this stuff. And after we released that version of the Creative Suite, my boss asked me, hey, do you want to do it again? You want to you be the group program manager for CS5? And I said, you know, I think there's enough demand for this Agile stuff uh, that uh, we might be able to do Agile training full-time. And so my boss created a new role for me at Adobe 
uh, to be the agile trainer and coach. And that was largely because I was contributing beyond my job description. I was already doing the new job before it was even uh, an official job at Adobe. So lesson four to me is to contribute beyond your job description. Uh, when you're interested in something, uh, find ways to start doing the new job, uh, even before you have the job title. Um, I'm not advocating that you do two jobs, that you work twice as hard. I wasn't you know, working 16 hours a day, uh, but I was contributing whenever I could beyond my job description. Um, so every opportunity I had to work with those other teams, uh, I would I would try and help however I could. And then that led to the creation of this new role. So that was lesson four for me is contribute beyond your job description. And it ties into lesson five a little bit as well. But let's get to that one. So uh, in my role as the agile trainer and coach, we were able to have some good success at the product level that spread out to other parts of the company, kind of beyond product development. And as uh, more and more parts of the organization started adopting some of these agile approaches, um, I saw it kind of spreading outward. And then my hypothesis was that it would also spread upward as there was more and more kind of insight in the organization for what this agile stuff could do for the company. Uh, I, I assumed that more and more leadership would understand what was going on. And, and there was some early evidence of that where uh, I remember this meeting I was in um, where it was like a early meeting for the next big launch of the suite. And they were talking about some 1.0 product uh, that they wanted to build. Um, and the people that were in charge of that had kind of spec'd it out. And the CEO at the time, Bruce, said, well, um, what's your time frame for developing this new product? And they said, well, it's probably three years out before we'd be able to release this publicly. And we had used Scrum to build a 1.0 product in 18 months. And Bruce, the CEO at the time, said, wait a minute, Soundbooth released in 18 months. What was that process they used? And it kind of went down the chain of command where Bruce asked um, Bill, who was the director of engineering, Bill, what was that thing called? And Bill looked at me and said, Peter, what did you call that thing? We said, oh, that's called Scrum. And Bill said, oh, Bruce, it's called Scrum. And then Bruce said, ah, you should try Scrum on that new product. Maybe you can get it out sooner than three years. So there was like some awareness. They didn't really understand why it worked, right? So I had this theory that would bubble up. And then I found over and over again that it, it there was awareness and like interest in figuring out how to do it. And then it would hit the C-suite. And I just kept hitting this ceiling of like, ah, there, they, something about this is not translating the way it has. It spread to a certain level. I'm not sure what that's all about. So I started reading anything I could get my hands on. I was looking for like, what's the scrum of leadership? Because scrum had been such a useful tool at the team level. I was curious what that was at the organizational level. And one book that I came across that many of you are probably familiar with is the book by Lalu, Reinventing Organizations. So I read through the book and I was like, oh, this gives me some answers um, about what's happening here. It gave me some new language and some new distinct distinctions that helped me understand what was going on. And I knew that nobody at the executive level was going to ask me to teach a class on this Lalu model. But I was a big believer that if you really wanted to under understand something, you had to teach it. And since nobody was going to ask me to teach about this thing, I just decided to make a little explainer video. So I made one of these kind of whiteboard animation videos explaining the Lalu model, posted that online. Uh, I tagged the author, Frederick Lalu, in that post. Lalu said, hey, this is a great explanation of the concepts in the book and retweeted it and it went viral. Um, and this was not something I was expecting. Uh, like as of this morning, that video in its few different places that it lives these days has over 300,000 views. And so it was something that I didn't like plan on, hey, let me create some viral marketing content. I wasn't trying to market anything at the time. I was just kind of pursuing where my energy was. And um, something that I did purely as a learning exercise ended up opening up a ton of new doors that I never would have predicted, uh, including eventually teaming up with Richard and Trisha at Agile for All. And uh, and going out on uh, away from Adobe and becoming kind of a consultant and doing speaking engagements and things like that. Uh, and so lesson five for me is follow your energy, follow your interests. Um, 
a lot of times we have no idea what the next thing is going to be. And it's really hard to predict and to plan. Let me pursue this path. But I found over and over again, if you just follow what interests you and find ways to make a contribution in that area, a theme obviously that goes throughout the talk, find ways to make contributions in areas that are interesting to you, um, that tends to open up doors that you never would have predicted. Uh, so figure out a way to, to share the thing that brings you joy more broadly. So those are the five lessons to be a contribution, to have a plan, but pivot for opportunity, to volunteer, even if you don't feel ready to go beyond your job description and then to follow your interests. And then the last thing I'll say about this is that uh, we need to be the CEOs of our own careers. Um, in each of those moves I've made, I had to take the lead. While I had several bosses that were super supportive, that were really helpful allies in my career development, uh, no one else cares more about my career than I do. Uh, so being the CEO of our career means we need to have a purpose. We need to have a vision for that. We need to have some strategy. Um, we need to hold ourselves accountable for spending time on developing our skills, uh, for making a contribution, for looking for those opportunities and finding more meaning in our work. And whether you get promoted or not, taking these steps allow us to increase our capability, allow us to find more meaning in our work and allow us to have more of a positive impact for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our teams and organizations, and ultimately in the world. So take the lead, be a contribution today. In addition to the ones I shared in the presentation, there are certainly other themes in my career, including developing a strong network of people I enjoy collaborating with and building my own brand and kind of following my intuition about when to stay in a role, when to leave it. But the underlying theme of being a contribution and then seeking to make a more impactful contribution over time flows through all of the lessons. If there's someone you know that would benefit from hearing this, please share the episode with them. No two careers are the same, so we'd love to hear the lessons you've learned. Drop us a note in the comments to share it with the audience. And we'd appreciate it if you would like the video and subscribe to the Humanizing Work channel to get notified of future episodes like this one. Thanks for watching.